Okay, so this is going to be a uh, summary of all the key points that we've learned over the last uh, few years uh, regarding the superior capsular reconstruction. Uh, so where did it all come from? Well, it was originally described by Teru Mahata in Japan, and this is a classic example of necessity is the mother of invention. In Japan, as of, uh, it wasn't until three years ago where their reverse shoulder replacement was available for them. So they didn't have any other options, let's say, five, six years ago. Uh, what is it? Well, it's an anatomic reconstruction of the superior capsule of the glenohumeral joint that biomechanically restores the normal fulcrum of the shoulder. Now, there's an anatomic distinction between a bridging patch graft and a superior capsule reconstruction. It has to do with the medial attachments. Uh, you'll notice on the medial side with the bridging patch graft, it's attached to the remnant cuff, uh, whereas a superior capsule reconstruction, it's attached directly to the uh, glenoid. Now, there has been, uh, over the last three years, over 10,000 SCRs performed with a tremendous buzz in the news of what Steve Burkhart calls this biologic reverse. Now, here are some of the key points, starting with number one. Uh, it's very important to mobilize the cuff, which is a good investment to make. You see here I'm uh, freeing up the scar tissue in the lateral gutter. Um, but you want to free up all the scar tissue to see, first and foremost, can you fix the rotator cuff? Because in a lot of cases, you're able to, to fix it. In this one, we're not able to. Uh, we're freeing up the scar tissue. This is with the Apollo RF right on top of the cuff, freeing it up. And it's a little bit of sculpting here, sculpting it out. But this can take a lot of time, sculpting it out, getting it freed up. Now we're on the undersurface of the cuff, again, freeing up the scar tissue. So it's a tremendous amount of time here. Now we're looking through a lateral portal. You can see here we've got a bleeding uh, bursal leader. Uh, which is connecting the scar tissue from the internal deltoid fascia to the, uh, to the cuff. We're removing that and, again, continuing to free it up. But very important to free up that scar tissue. Uh, number two, superior labor in the biceps. Well, the biceps is often gone from the index procedure. However, it's not, then it's typically torn or unstable. Then you have to decide you want to do either a biceps tenodesis or a tenotomy. Uh, in most cases, you want to leave the superior labrum. Uh, you can see in this case we're preparing the footprint just medial to the superior labrum. However, if it's a big, bulky labrum, uh, you can certainly debride it. Number three, uh, about 10 years ago, Nicole Poliart published uh, her article on the superior capsule. Uh, and we found that after removal of the rotator cuff, the superior capsule is indeed a distinct anatomic structure, which is very important to the normal function of the shoulder. Now, Peter Millett was the lead author in this study where we looked at the safety of glenoid anchors for the SCR. Uh, what we did was inserted three beef pins arthroscopically into 12 cadaveric uh, shoulders. And uh, all three anchor positions were safe with respect to the suprascapular nerve. And we noticed that the minimum distance to the suprascapular nerve was that posterior superior anchor and was at least 10 millimeters away. So, so they're safe uh, using those three anchors at 10, 12, and 2. Um, and you see in this uh, demonstration, um, we're arthroscopically confirming it. In this case, the uh, 12 o'clock anchor, that's the suprascapular nerve at the tip of that probe. Uh, it's about 15 millimeters away. So that was just a cadaveric demonstration just showing how far away the suprascapular nerve is. Um, now, typically, all the anchors, and this is interesting, are rotated when you insert them. They tend to be rotated posteriorly on a clock face. So instead of, this is a left shoulder, instead of being 10, 12, and 2, they're more at, at 11, 12, 30, and 3. So you have to resist that urge. You have to go into the case knowing that, especially that anterior superior anchor, that 10 o'clock anchor, so to speak, uh, in this case, because you don't want anterior superior escape. So you really have to make sure that you come down as low as you can on, on the front there. And then arguably the most important point from, from the study, other than the safety, was the superior anchor trajectory. And we found this in the lab, that that's the, mo that the one that's most at risk for glenoid face perforation. So if you stare at the red arrow, just a suggestion, go a little bit more medial. Um, and as you can see in this live patient, we uh, move the anchor position more medial, not only decrease the chance of glenoid face perforation, but also decrease the chance of converging on the other two anchors. So just a nice, uh, important pearl there. Uh, number four, we all know with every construct there's a weak link. With the superior capsular reconstruction, it's on the glenoid. Now, we've all done all different types of ways of fixing it on the glenoid side. You just saw Peter demonstrate one way, uh, double pulley suture tacks, uh, labral tape and push locks. Uh, we've done them all, but I want to show you a relatively new advancement in glenoid fixation. So there's a cadaveric demonstration, a left shoulder. Uh, you can see we made a large rotator cuff here. Uh, we placed the three spinal needles in, representing the 10, 12, and 2 o'clock uh, positions. Prepared the bone bed, as you can see there, on the glenoid and also on the greater tuberosity. 
And what we're going to be doing is showing you three knotless suture tacks. So we've inserted the uh, drill guide here. I like to tap it with a mallet, kind of keeps it nice and stable. And I do that for all my instability, uh, decrease the chance of it skiving. Uh, inserting the knotless suture tack, take the little black tab away here and then you just pull it straight out. Now to speed things up, we're now going to show you the 12 and the 2 o'clock anchors magically are done. And uh, now we're going to go over to the greater tuberosity side and uh, place in either a 475 or 55 um, biocomposite swivel lock anchor preloaded with either fiber tape or tiger tape. So the beauty of this technique is you're placing all five anchors ahead of time. You're going to pass all the sutures through the graft later on. And, and I, in my opinion, I just think it makes it uh, much easier. So number five, uh, is the SCR just a spacer? Well, this is a study that uh, True Mahata did in Ty Lee's lab that was published in AGSM in 2012. And they looked at this. They looked at superior translation. And if you look at one that's the intact state, there's normally three millimeters of, of uh, superior translation with proximally loading the uh, humerus. With a massive rotator cuff tear, it's off the charts. Bridging patch graft did not restore the normal superior restraint, whereas the superior capsular reconstruction did. And biomechanically, that's what we're doing. The SCR restores the fulcrum back to the glenohumeral joint so that you go from this preoperatively to this postoperatively. Now, this is a follow-up to the first study looking at anatomic safety of placing the three anchors in the superior glenoid. Uh, Peter Millet again took the lead on this study uh, where we looked at different uh, fixation techniques at the superior glenoid. In this particular technique, we found that with the three knotless suture tacks, had very good ultimate uh, load to failure with minimal variation, which is obviously very important. Number six. Uh, we know that proper tension in the graft is arguably the most important step in the operation. Um, this is something that uh, um, Gus Mazaka and I have been studying at UConn, trying to figure out that optimal arm position. Can't tell you that right now. However, I can tell you most surgeons uh, seem to be, when they're measuring between the anchors um, with a dermal allograft, are tensioning the graft in about 30 to 40 degrees of uh, abduction. Um, however, from our own SOS data, uh, this is patient reported outcome data, in the short term, it doesn't seem to make a, a uh, clinically a difference at this point. But again, we're still uh, very early on in this process. Now, uh, back to the cadaveric demonstration. So now we're going to be uh, using the SCR measuring device. And this makes it very convenient for measuring the distances between the anchors. So you've got to have first the proper arm position. Once you get the proper arm position, you calibrate it to zero on the guide there, as you see there, we did with a snap. And then you can bring it over to that anterior anchor on the greater tuberosity. It's nice because you can go across an arc with this measuring device. We measure it 20 millimeters in this case, mark it on the back table. Then we go to that posterior superior anchor on the glenoid. And you can see in this particular case, it's 30 millimeters. Now we're done with that anchor. Now we're going to go to that anterior superior anchor. Um, this is the knotless suture tack. Calibrate it back to zero again and then go over to the greater tuberosity. Happens to be, in this case, 30 millimeters again. And now we can go across the arc of the glenoid. We're going to measure 15 and 15 again, so 15 between uh, each of the anchors on the glenoid side. Uh, but again, the most important measurements are medial lateral. Uh, measuring the distances here, 15 between each of them. Adding in 5 to 10 millimeters of extra graft all the way around. Now we're putting the little poke holes where the um, greater tuberosity, that medial row, those uh, anchors, the, the sutures are going to go through. Um, and then adding on, on the greater tuberosity side where you're going to do the speed bridge, just adding an extra centimeter, 12 millimeters of extra tissue, a little A for anterior, and then we're going to cut the excess graft away. Now where the fiber tapes are going to slide through, you take that swivel lock driver, and that's where you can uh, uh, make it easier on yourself so that the tapes slide uh, nice and easy. Just you can put little, two little poke holes. Now you can see anterior is the front there, also showing the sterile towel so you don't drag the skin floor into the shoulder. Another very important pearl for you guys is, uh, and I've done this, I've tangled sutures in the past, is have your assistant really pull tension on those sutures. Really crank on them to make sure that when you're going to grab the sutures that you don't tangle up the sutures. So have them really pull tension on them uh, while you're doing this. Now we're going to go over to the glenoid side and we're going to grab the, um, the little, little looped end in the uh, knotless suture tack suture. Uh, take it out and what we're going we're to do is it's going to be a horizontal inverted mattress. So we're going to go up. And we're going to go down, and then we're going to pass that same suture through the little passing loop of the knotless suture tack. And then you're going to see your assistant with the little arrow there. You just pull on that suture right there, and you can see how it loads it in. And then again, just for the uh, sake of time, we're going to speed it up. Now we've done the uh, 12 o'clock and the 10 o'clock anchors in this case, too. So now we uh, uh, have it all 
uh, pass them ready to go. You fold it over like a cigar and you just push it straight in. Don't rotate your forearm. I've done that before and you flip it upside down. It's really embarrassing and a pain to get that untangled. So just go straight in. You'll feel a pop once it goes in and then you're all set. Um, little pearl here uh, with the 12 millimeter passport. Before you load the sutures in there, I just want to point this out. You could fold it over and ahead of time so you know you won't get stuck because that's always the concern. If you get stuck, it's one way with those knotless suture tacks. You can't reverse them. So you just take it ahead of time and make sure you can go right through the uh, passport. Great. Now you know you're going to be in good shape when you're, you're doing it. You don't have any worries. However, let's say you're struggling a little bit there. Then what you can do is what Steve Burkhardt has taught us, uh, bivalve the cannula. You bivalve it and then you can stick it right back into the shoulder. Number seven. Um, so we're uh, fixating the graft here. Um, I love it. So you're just pulling on each of those sutures from the knotless suture tacks on the uh, line. I love the 12 o'clock one. See how it goes, whoop, and pops right over the top. It even makes that noise. And so you get it right over there and you just keep pulling on each of those sutures and secure it in place. So there's no tying knots. That's the beauty of this. So all the work was done outside the body. For me, I like to make the procedure as simple as possible. And so it's nice with this procedure because now all you're doing is the speed bridge on the lateral row. So you get the speed bridge, you're gonna do some side to side posteriorly and a side to side anteriorly um, as you can see here. So that's the uh, final construct there. Now a little word on side-to-side -side sutures. We used to always say posteriorly every time for stability and augmentation. Keep in mind these are pedicles. See all the bleeding that, that was coming occurring there? Um, so for the remodeling process is very helpful, but also for that um, anteriorly now we're realizing uh, because of Poisson's ratio, we could talk about that in the panel discussion. It's probably important to also be doing uh, anterior side-to-side -side sutures, especially lateral. So the uh, final construct, if you tension it properly, you get what we call that reverse trampoline effect uh, when everything's uh, tensioned properly. And what you find is uh, even when you uh, remove the deltoid, you can see as we're pushing on it here, and we're not faking this, we're really pushing on this, when you tension it properly, it doesn't hit the undersurface of the uh, acromion when you have it uh, with the arm at the side. And you have to transect the graft. Um, and not only then is it unstable superiorly, but it's also unstable inferiorly as well. So it becomes completely unstable at that point. Number nine, um, we know there's numerous studies over the years that have shown that dermal allografts in the shoulder are safe, including MRI studies demonstrating no complications and numerous uh, ultrasound studies. And this is a case report of Evan Letterman's of a uh, patient who had an SCR, but unfortunately two months after surgery fell and tore his construct. Um, then it was explanted at one year, and you can see there's already neoangiogenesis and uh, um, uh, tendinous remodeling of the arthroflex. Now, I prefer the three millimeter arthroflex. The one millimeter is just not thick enough, the three millimeter, um, and because it has the matricell processing, which removes over 97% of the DNA, so less chance of an immunogenic response. It's also sterile and very strong. Finally, last one, number 10. Uh, numerous people in this room can tell you that most of these patients clinically do very well um, uh, including a, a true Mahata study, 24 patients who had significant improvements in acromial humeral distance and ASCS scores. So most of these patients do very well. We also have the prelim uh, uh, data that we've uh, uh, now submitted to the Journal of Arthroscopy um, with the uh, BRASS group. And you see that most of our patients in our study had very large rotator cuff tears, um, all sorts of um, um, uh, wide variation for homotic classification of arthritis. And um, a lot of these patients had significant uh, atrophy of their, of their muscles. Um, what we found was 75% uh, patient satisfaction at one year. We were happy with this. I mean, you think about this, the A, the learning curve, and B, this very difficult patient population. Um, we didn't really have any other great options before this other than maybe a reverse. Um, so 75% satisfaction was great. We think the number will be even higher in the future, uh, maybe 80, 85, maybe more than 90% um, if you learn from some of, the, some of our observations. So some of our early observations was graph size, very important. The thicker the graph, the better the outcome. Uh, three out of the five patients with a one millimeter graph went on to a reverse shoulder. So very important using the three millimeter graft. Next one is arthritis. Uh, the less arthritis, the better the outcome. Think of a traffic light. Hamada one and two, and that just has to deal with migration, with the Hamada classification. One and two, it's a green light. Go ahead, do the SCR. Hamada three, where you start to have adaptive changes on the undersurface of the acromion, that's where you get the caution. That's the yellow light. Just be careful because the results aren't as good, at least in our study. And then when you get to red, where they have arthritis, that's the stop and think maybe that's not the best option, so that's the stop at the traffic light.
And finally, the size of the tear, uh, the larger the tear, the uh, lower the success rate. Um, and there's SOS data, uh, which is also shown that these pa patients feel better rather soon. So if you ask somebody who's done a lot of these, um, they'll tell you these patients feel great, but be careful because you'll, uh, your patients will send you videos like this. This is one of my patients I did maybe six months ago who's four months post-op, and he's sending me this video, four months post-op. I'm like, are you kidding me? What happened to all those conversations we had? So just try and tell them that because that's another thing we learned is you've got to slow these people down. Um, and arguably the most important slide I have for you this entire presentation, I've presented this in the past, but it's worth mentioning one more time. Uh, this is a histologic uh, a study that uh, uh, Julie Adams and Scott Steinman did at the Mayo Clinic, uh, canine model. They looked at four different time points, time zero, uh, six weeks, uh, three months, and six months. And what they found was at time zero, it's just a collagen sponge. Six weeks, there's already native cellular infiltration and neotendin development. At three months, this is where it gets interesting. The grafts were completely disorganized with hyaline degeneration. We're going to go back to that in a moment. Whereas at six months, there was normal tendon structure grossly and histologically in this canine model. Most important point, though, was when they looked at the load to failure testing at time zero and six months, all of the constructs failed at the attachment sites, both medial and lateral. However, at three months, over 75% of the constructs failed mid-substance. So the graft gets weaker before it gets stronger. We know this with allografts. Just like you wouldn't have an ACL patient going back and playing soccer at two months, you don't have these SCR patients have unrestricted activities at two months. Slow your patients down. Good, good pearl that may help with your outcomes too. So summary slide, number one, careful dissection of the scar tissue to see if you can repair it. Number two, address the biceps, leave the superior labrum. Number three, the superior capsule is critical for normal shoulder function. Uh, number four, glenoid anchors are safe, but that 12 o'clock anchor, just go a little more medial. Um, number five, uh, glenoid three knotless suture tax and greater tuberosity speed bridge works really well. Uh, number six, proper tensioning. If you're going to err, err towards the side of slightly over tensioning than under tensioning. Um, number seven, side to side sutures increase stability. Number eight, the SCR restores the fulcrum back to the glenohumeral joint. Number nine, dermal allografts, especially Arthroflex, are safe in the shoulder. And finally, number 10, most SCR patients do very well, but consider a conservative rehab program. Thank you. <laughs>